I'm Mary Lyons, and I am The Wealth Woman. And I'm Eric Alexander from Benchmark Income Group. And this is The Big Wealth Podcast. Everything you've ever been taught about money is wrong. But don't worry, we're here to help. On this podcast, we'll use the same tools you already know to actually help set you free. Free to do what you want with your time, with your money, and with your energy. Free to live your life the way you have dreamt about. So we're going to talk about wealth knowledge, personal reflections, and the financial industry news of the day. Welcome to the Big Wealth Podcast. Today is a really exciting episode for us because we are one year old, right? Not our podcast, but Benchmark Income Group is officially (laughs) one year old. (laughs) And not Mary and I. We're slightly older than that. (laughs) <laughs> just slightly. We won't tell you how much. Um, but I, I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to talk a little bit about how we started, how and why we started Benchmark Income Group, and then maybe talk a little bit about what's happened over the past year and yeah. our our goals for the future. So yeah, it's um, been a crazy. So guess, it's been a crazy year. Yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things where I guess it was probably the the middle-ish of the pandemic, the beginning of summer, uh, Benchmark Income Group officially started on June 1st of 2020. And I think there's a part of me that thought if the world's already gone crazy, what's a little more chaos in the mix? Let's just, you know, quit our jobs and start a new company. Let's as do is it. Your, as is your nickname. Right, right. Yeah, I do get called chaos quite frequently. What does that stand for? Uh, it was from a uh, General Mattis. That was his nickname. It was uh, Commander has another outstanding suggestion. <laughs> it was the acronym, right? And it creates chaos. So um, I just want to go back and think a little bit about like mindset at that particular point in time and give a little history. So yeah, um, I think we talked a little bit about this in a previous podcast. But my I, I worked with my dad for a long time. Um, and I, I started out with him just as an advisor and I moved kind of into that sales manager, um, kind of role manager of other advisors. And then eventually he and I went kind of 50, 50 and we divvied up responsibilities and he did a lot of the, um, kind of closing of bringing new advisors in and I would source them on the front end. And then, uh, you and I both did a lot of training and management of those advisors. He kind of ran all the administrative side of things. And, um, after gosh, 10 years of working together, he was ready to retire. And the plan had been that I would take over personal economics group, which was his company. And as we got closer and closer Uh, my husband kept saying to me, you're about to have everything that you've been working for, for the past 10 years. And I have never seen you less excited about what you're doing. And, um, and, and I just thought, yeah, that's kind of accurate. And there was a lot going on at the time. Uh, We were in the middle of remodeling a property. We were actually living with my parents at that particular point in time as well, as our property was being remodeled. (laughs) And, um, God, it was just crazy. My kids were young. They were babies at that point. Um, I mean, cause this was three, three years ago when all this was happening right. or leading yeah, up yeah. to it, so really probably almost four years ago, but, um, you know, it just, it was one of those things where I just found myself going, why don't I want this right now? Right. And, um, God, the conversations were so hard, Eric, because I had to tell my dad, you know, you've built this company and you want to have this legacy and I don't want it. And, um, and it was a very, very emotional conversation because I felt like I was letting him down, but there was so much going on. It, it, I, I found that my love for the industry wasn't there. And I was waking up on Monday mornings or going to bed on Sunday nights with just this sense of almost dread of like, oh, here we go. I got to like turn it on and make it work. And I found myself wondering, am I, am I like really burned out? Like, do I need to find something else to do? And I think really what happened was with my personality, um, when I have an idea, I want to run with it. And when you have a business partner, Um, it depends on your business partner, whether that works, but this was my dad's baby and he was in that transition out mode. And I think that's hard because it's yours, right? So giving up control is very difficult. There's questions about 
relevance, all of that type of stuff. And he was thinking in terms of maximizing his short-term revenue right before he made his exit. And I was wanting to lay foundations for longer term projects. Right. And so our, our goals were in some ways at odds with one another. Um, and I don't think you can ever really escape the fact that you work with a parent, right? There's a parent child dynamic that happens right. there that doesn't happen in any other work environment. And so I just found myself being a little burned out um, my kids still, you know, they wanted to hang out with me all the time. And I knew being an advisor that I could get away with working 30 to 35 hours a week if I was staffed properly. Um, and I could spend that time with my kids. And I also knew if I took over a company that with the goals that I had in mind, that I would be working a lot more than 30 to 35 hours a week. And, um, you know, I don't know how much this plays into things when men are making decisions, you can weigh in on that. But for me, yeah everything I do in my life, like my biggest priority is my kids. And so even like the work I do is about making sure that they can have, that they can see a role model, that sort of thing. Um, and I just, I couldn't do it. And so I had to, I had to tell my dad, I know this is what we've been working towards, but we need to find another solution. And I think, you know, right. partly there was a lot of emotion there for him, but I think partly too, he was ready to be done. And I was like, sorry to blow up your plans, but you're going to have to work a little right. longer. Um, and so what we ended up doing is uh, finding somebody else local in Dallas to come in and purchase personal economics group and um, create that alliance with our broker dealer and take over the running of the firm. And I stepped completely out of management back into the role solely of being a financial advisor. And I know that transition impacted you too, because it, it kind of disrupted all the routine that we had leading up to that. Right, right. Yeah, well, that, and it's sort of funny because I remember those, those conversations and you're right, you were, uh, I felt like you were, um, as much as you were working towards that end, you could tell that you were really unhappy. Yeah, you could tell that you were just sort of like, life sucks. I'm burned out. I don't want to do this. I'm I'm out. Right, but it's uh, you know I heard a joke about being president. Like the day you're you're president, and the next day you're not president. It's like going from 100 miles an hour to five mm -hmm. miles an hour. And so I feel like you were going sort of 100 miles an hour with your hair on fire to like just I just want to be a producer again. Like I just yeah. want to be a, a, an advisor, right? And and you could tell it was like a little bit less stress, but not in a good way. Like, yeah, there was this sort of like pent up energy that you couldn't release anywhere. Yeah. And I think at first, like for the first probably six months to a year, I just felt a tremendous amount of relief um, because I could focus on the clients and there were no other demands on my time. Um, you know, and I think for for the two years that that we stayed on with personal economics group, I traveled more than I have at any other point in time in my life. Like I, I did the math on the second year and I took off more than three months total, <laughs> um, out of the year. Um, and that was partly because I didn't work at all on Fridays. And then I tried to take a trip almost every month and, you know, it, it, it gave me the ability to do those things and still make sure my clients were taken care of. Cause I had, I had good help. Right. Um, but yeah, I got bored is part of what happened is that, at some point, I think there is, um, uh, so Kevin talks about this sometimes, and it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose, purpose right. that you have to have all three of those things. And I think, you know, I, I lost some autonomy because I wasn't, I wasn't in charge, right? Um, and I gained it in other ways. So that, that's kind of interesting. The purpose was definitely still there for me, but I felt like, okay, I know how to do planning, what else? Like I need a, I need a bigger challenge. And so um, you need a battle yeah, to fight, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can always, you know, people always say, well, if you want a bigger challenge, move up market. And I was like, but that's not where my heart is. Like, I don't need to work with people that have tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. I like working with people who are building something. That's just where my sweet spot is. And so, you know, it, it, it sort of changed a little bit of my focus but I also just realized I'm a terrible employee. Like my engagement level when I am like working for someone else isn't there the same way. And so after about two years, a little over two years, I just was like, you know what? 
I, this is what I worked for my, my whole life. I feel like I have sort of recovered this, the purpose and the connection to the work that we're doing. And now I can do it my own way. And my kids were a little older and it just, it made sense. And I remember, uh, cause it was in the middle of COVID, right? I, it's not like I could walk into your office and talk to you about it. So I think we my zoom did, office. Yeah. We did it over a zoom call where I told you, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. You want to come with me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and, and as much of a, uh, oh, wow. Okay. It was sort of like, <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Like it's, yeah. you know, you could see the sort of like, I don't know if it's atrophy is the word for it, but sort of like, I'm so like, there, there's a theory that if, if the world magically turned around and gave us everything we wanted so that all we had to do is sort of worry about eating and procreating, like we'd find a way to wreck the system just for something to do. To do, right? the challenge. Just the challenge, right? And so you could tell that there was that sort of like itch, like I've got to go, I want to go run this thing again, right? Yeah, my mom used to say when I was growing up that um, she used to say, it's not good when you're bored because when you get bored, there's not enough occupying your brain and you become disruptive. Right. <laughs> And I definitely think there was an element of that, like what, what needs to be disrupted so that I get engaged at a full level and I'm constantly challenged. And so, um, so we had some conversations with our, our broker dealer and the insurance carriers that we work with and everybody was like, yeah, go for it. Let's do it. We're going to support you. And so when I think about what our, our ideas were at that time, at least for me, there were a couple of things happening. Um, the retention rate in our industry is that we lose, well, we lose 91% of the people who come into financial services over a four-year time period. That's, that's the most recent statistic that I've read. And that really bugs me um, because it's I think- It's disheartening. We, well, we do a disservice to consumers and to clients if they don't know that their advisors are going to be there for the long haul. I mean, you look at that, it says if the industry brings on a hundred people as advisors, only nine of them will still be working with clients four years in. And those numbers are atrocious. And one of the things that I always struggled with was convincing people that they needed to come do this as a career. Because even though it has changed my life in so many wonderful ways, I watched people come in go into debt, fail out and completely destroy their self-esteem and sometimes their marriages along the way. And so it was hard to say like, hey, come do this job with me because you're like, eh, there's a really bad chance that you're actually gonna be here a little while from now. And right. so, um, so in our conversations about this, I think we started working on this in like 2015. So long before- Right, as a um, concept, right? Yeah, was the idea of creating an incubator for advisors. And that that stemmed from, I think, I think it was you who showed me there was like an article in Forbes that was about businesses, just businesses, not financial, but just businesses starting in the United States. And the failure rate over a three-year time period was somewhere between like 80 and 90%. But then they had the statistics for companies that started inside of an incubator and it flipped the statistics on the head so that they had an 80 to 90% success rate over the same time period. And it was like, light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> Little Minions movie there, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's it, right? It's, it's that idea of, uh, I think most of the training for financial advisors is, okay, you've got your licenses, you've got your badge and your gun, you're on the job. Now get out there, tiger, and go sell something, right? And it's just ah, like, for sure. and if and if you're not one of those rare breeds that could be dropped into the middle of the jungle with a knife and a compass and go like forge out a new civilization, you you get beaten to death by it, right? Because there was not a lot of infrastructure to support you, and I and I think jadedly some parts of the industry that's kind of the goal, like we yeah. we just want you out there sourcing people because it's really hard to go source people, and we really kind of almost want you to fail because then we've got your you're basically a cheap marketing arm for us and we get to keep the book of business we don't have to pay you anymore right i mean that's right. and we didn't have to pay you to, to begin with like you were a free marketing arm that we didn't have to do anything for other than give you a place to work for five minutes right and so well, it's and some places don't even do that some places charge to give you an office space so you're paying rent even though they're not paying you just so you can market using their name. Right. And so, um, which I've never really understood that has not made a lot of sense to me, right. but, 
But I do think, you know, you think about this idea that incubator, what it's really meant to do is get someone who either is from completely outside the industry up to speed over a 12 month time period. And at least in our office, we partner that almost with an apprenticeship so that you have a mentor who's working you through all of this. And, you know, and I use the word mentor, not boss for a reason, right? Because I'm so entrepreneurial. You're so entrepreneurial. The idea of having somebody tell me you have to do this and you have a quota and this has always been greatly disturbing to me. Right. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, but, my, my boss is Wells Fargo because I got to go make my mortgage payment. Like I don't need any other incentive to go out to work. Right, <laughs> right. right. So, so to me, I wanted to create this entrepreneurial atmosphere where people could go into business for themselves with all the support and mentorship of two extremely successful, experienced advisors. I'm talking about you and me, right? Yeah. And um, and really create something. Keep looking that around, going their just... own. Yeah. So you know, I think about that and um. And, and I think we've done a good job of that because the feedback, so there was one other advisor that came with us that uh, we had hired probably a year before we started and her feedback on the training was like night and day where over the past year, we've watched her just gain this tremendous sense of confidence, not, not necessarily in herself because she always had that, but confidence in the advice that she's giving and the approach that she's taking. And I just think that is so cool, right? And our curriculum is a six month program with class every day. So there's an hour of class every day. Um, And at the end of that six month program, we actually recommend that the advisor goes back through it a second time, because what you learn on the front end while you're drinking from the fire hose is very different than what you learn the second time you go through it, where you have your foundation. Um, But we also, I mean, this is something that as we hire experienced advisors, we also require them to go through because we want to make sure that they unlearn all of the bad habits they have from other places and reprogram the right Kool-Aid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to use the word indoctrination. That's really bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that that's part of it. And, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, I think that one of the problems that people face is uh, as advisors is that wherever you work influences how you approach planning. So if you work for an insurance company, everything you do is about insurance. And if you work for an investment company or a wirehouse, everything you do is about investments. And, and you and I, Eric, were raised in this sort of hybrid environment with that right. sort of objective look at what are all the tools available to me? What do they do? How did they work? And so philosophically, uh, we really wanted to have that approach. Right. Yeah. And how do you, how do you indoctrinate? but you know but how do you sort of pass on that thing right and i somebody asked me you know where else did you work before before peg personal economics group and i'm like I, this was my first shot at it like this was my first sort of uh like start starting and stopping point in the industry and i didn't i didn't know any other way other than we look at everything dispassionately objectively we put them together in what ways it makes sense and we we build out systems not accounts we've, we've had that sort of conversation before but mm-hmm. and they're like it this is so revolutionary i'm like yeah but i didn't i didn't know what i was i didn't know what i didn't know right, right. And so it's it's sort of like it, it's sort of neat kind of having that conversation we even with the experienced advisors and they kind of had that light bulb moment and they're like i didn't even know this was possible and i'm like i right. didn't know that the other way was possible right i mean it's sort of it, we sort of joke around these conversations like i didn't i thought everybody did this like isn't this right the way. Well, and I think it's been interesting too, as we've interviewed candidates to hire um, over the past year is how frequently the candidates who are going through our interview process say things like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can you put me into the calculators? <laughs> right? Like right. show me, show me my numbers. Let me see what's happening. And I think right. that's really cool to take experienced advisors who in some cases have been in the business, you know, five years or longer and have them go, wait, this is what, why, why has no one showed me this? And then they become so passionate about it that they, that they jump in. And that happened even yesterday. I was talking to a woman who uh, just joined our firm um, and she's been licensed for either eight or nine years. And she was like, my mom, I mean, it was so, it was so fun to go through it and to see like her excitement level about 
And she was going on, oh my gosh, I need to call this person. I need to call this person. I've got this friend that needs to understand this. Um, and like making the list of the people she was going to help in the, in the conversation. And that's right. where, like, I think we've been very lucky because when we started, there were what, four of us, three advisors and one yep. staff member. Right. Um, and so right now, I think we have about 14 people total. Right. Um, and so, um, and that really has happened this year because I think we maybe hit five by the end of last year, we hired one person and right. then almost all of these new hires have come on in the past couple of months. And, you know, it's, it's, I always feel like I'm a slow starter when we do something new, because I really want to lay the foundation and understand like where, where there are flaws in our system, because I'm not a great systems person. I know that that's why you're here. Right. <laughs> you can design them, right. but, but neither of us are particularly good at maintaining them. And so we really, I think with the incubator had to run it and run it through two full times before we could figure out, okay, what's going on? Where are the problems? And I feel like we've got that piece down. Um, and so now what seems to be happening is as we've gotten those advisors educated that we're kind of in our system is that now we have the room to kind of expand because we can expand the training but right. we also have found that as we have been so excited about the messaging that um like this is the first time in my life and i've been an advisor for what about 15 years right. that i we've got a waiting list for clients that's almost two months deep at this point. Right. And so it really is like, we're almost on a hiring spree, <laughs> I guess. Right. Well, because we need bodies to handle it all, right? Them. Yeah. And that, but yeah. that goes back to like, from the very beginning, I always said, like, for me, I just want to change as many lives as possible. Like, if I think about where I get my sense of significance, it really comes from how many lives can I impact positively? And at some point as a, as an individual, you hit a wall, you hit a capacity issue. And the only way that you can expand that reach is by teaching other people how to do it. And that's something, Eric, like I, I gotta say just for a minute that I think you're phenomenal at the way you train people up and communicate concepts. I've never seen anything like it. Well, it's fun too, right? I mean, it, because it, it's self, it's rewarding in and of itself because you see you know, I'm thinking two or three advisors that we're working with right now, you, you sort of see these sort of germ in the idea mm -hmm. and then they kind of grab it and they're like, okay. And they, you can tell they're sort of wrestling with it a little bit. Like they're, okay, I think I got it. I think I got it. But then they'll come back and like their, their brain kind of pulls off that rut that it goes back to right. the old way of thinking about it. They're like, no, 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 no. Come with me. Right. And then they, and then they kind of have that moment and it's like riding a bike. It's like, you're struggling, you're struggling. And then you've got it and you can't, no, it's once easy. you have it, you can't lose it. Right? right. And then once they get there, they have that moment. They're like, oh, but what if, and what would I could, what could, and then they start reaching for that third and fourth and fifth rung of concept. Right. And then, and then they're just kind of off on their own at that point. And then they kind of reach back out with, Hey, I had this idea with this work. And then, and then that becomes really the fun part. Cause then you're just there to kind of like drop a pearl of wisdom every couple of months. Right. And you're like, Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I'll go do that. Right. Uh, but I think that was the other thing that we talked about at the beginning, especially with incubator on new advisors is that you, and you mentioned it, apprenticeship versus dictatorship, I guess maybe is a better way to say yeah, that yeah. versus boss, right? Is that a, that ability to do joint work, like come with me, let's do it together. Come with me. Let's, let's help you get up and running so that you're not having to go knife and a compass in the woods and figure it out. Like you've got somebody helping you along the way that keeps you up and running quickly um, and it makes and sure you're not giving people bad advice. Right. I mean, right. That, that's one of the things that has always disturbed me is that just because you have a license doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Right. If you don't have a license, you probably really don't in a lot of cases, but, um, but I think just cause you have the license also doesn't mean you're qualified and, and that ability to make sure that the, the clients of the firm as a whole are getting good quality, accurate evidence-based advice is so key. Right. And that's why that apprenticeship is, is so important because it gives us the ability to supervise. And, and I think honestly, it gives our advisors some peace of mind because they know they're not messing someone's life up. Right. I mean, where else right. can you have such a big impact on someone's life, maybe in the spiritual community or in the health realm, right. money is huge for, for 
dealing with people's quality of life. And it is a responsibility that I think our firm takes very seriously. Yeah, super. We understand what a privilege it is to, to get to work with people on that. So, you know, if I think about goals for the next year, I think that um, for me, one of the biggest goals is um, helping our advisors have a, a larger reach and get to a larger audience. And right. so over the past year, um, we hired a woman who's phenomenal and she has been kind of helping us experiment and figure out kind of the blend between what we're doing on social media, what happens from a public relations standpoint, what we're doing on the actual media, whether it's print or, or television or any of those types of things. Right. And I honestly think that's part of the reason that we have created the waiting list that we have at this point of clients and that we're trying to make sure that we can staff accordingly so that, that the waiting list doesn't get longer uh, at this point. Um, but that marketing part is such a big deal for advisors because a lot of times the advisors who are most gifted from a technical perspective have right. a harder time going out and I'm going to use the word hunting for clients, right? Because that's yeah. not the, they're, they're technical as far as their orientation, as opposed to being people oriented. But we also see the flip of that, where sometimes people who are really good at getting people to agree to have a meeting, don't understand anything from a technical <laughs> perspective. They just figured out if I say these words, people give me money. And, and to right. me, that's frightening. And so <laughs> at least I need to me. figure out that skill. I always had the first one, never the second one. I don't get to walk in a room and go, hi, how are you? And everyone walks up and says, We're, I've got bags of cash. How do I hand them to you? <laughs> yeah. So I think um, having that sort of hybrid where we have people who have high empathy and care about the people that they're working with and they have a sense of humility, but they're so attached to that purpose side of things um, is, is such a, an important blend. But that balance between the technical and the personal side of things, you know, if we can get you, it, it's like, I think about even things that have happened last year, you got published in Forbes, um, right. because we had someone who said like, Hey, this is good information. We need to share it. And, and those are the things that I think are so important right. is that when we have advisors who understand what's happening is helping them get the word out. And so, you know, we've, we've done part of that's the podcasting part of that's, we help them design right. their social media. We're in such a high compliance environment that it is a full-time job to create content and get it through compliance. And you can't right. do that and be working with clients at the same time. That's and too so, many hats, right? Right. And so we've kind of tried it out. We understand what's working. And I think my goal for the next year is to get that streamlined so that we can scale it as we scale with advisors as well. And then ultimately, you know, I think Long term, I'd like to see us get to a point where we have a hundred advisors. Like to me, at that point, I'm like, heck yeah, we've done a great job. Um, and maybe that's setting my sights too low. I'm not sure. Um, but but to me, the more people who are out there doing planning the right way and and really making an impact and a difference on the lives of their community members, the that's how I know I've done a good job at that point is that I can say, look, not only am I directly positively influencing people's lives, but here's everyone else that we've trained to do it as well. Well, and I, and I think it goes back to that idea of that abundance mindset versus scarcity of, you know, but, but if we all, if we only had 10 advisors, if we only had 25 or 50 or whatever, we, we could all sort of make more money because there's more of it coming to us kind of thing versus hiring more out. But DFW is a really big place. All the surrounding states are really big place. Like it's not about, it's not about us specifically. I think it's about that reach. Like right. how do we, how do we go create a system of people that are doing it right and that are being good guys and that are doing it with a purpose? Uh, Cause I think you're right. And that's, it's almost whether there's no test to go join the firm. Right. But that's, it's one of the things you and I kind of look for a lot of times is that idea of always doing the right thing because it's the right thing right? and, and making a difference. And I remember a conversation we had gosh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we met with her earlier this week of I can retire like that, that sort of sense of peace that people have once they figure that out, mm -hmm. like that's, that's worth all of it. Right. Absolutely. It's, you, it's you, you get to go home and go, man, I did a, I did okay today. Yeah. Well, you, it, it's, it's ultimately, and I tell people this all the time, right? The, the money's nice. I, I, I like the income that I make, 
But I think what keeps me engaged, because I could make money doing a lot of different things, right? There's nothing that says it would have to be this. But what keeps me engaged from a career perspective is that I get to have these amazing conversations where people let me into like the intimacies of their world, what's important to them, what their dreams are, what their hopes are, what their fears are. And then I get to help people take care of the financial piece and to help them design it in a way that they get those things faster. And we hopefully along the way, eliminate the fear attached with that. And so like we always jokingly say half of our job is math and the other half is therapy, right? Oh, and I, right. I don't think that's far from the truth just because of the, the intensity and the intimacy of the conversations that we have so frequently. But what on earth could be more rewarding than having someone call you and say, essentially, my life is better because you're in it. Thank you. Right. And getting up right. and getting to have that type of conversation all day long, every day. I don't know why you wouldn't be excited to come into work. Right. And, and it's not that it's always like sunshine and roses. Right. I mean, right. there are days that are brutal and they're difficult, either technically or emotionally or any of that. But I think the reason that like I stay engaged and keep going all goes into purpose. Right. And that's right. where, you know, sometimes I have to check my ego frequently. I have to check my ego at the door. Right. And remember that we really are in a service industry and our job is to serve our clients and help them achieve the, the things that they want for their life. And if we had a hundred people who all had that same mentality working for our firm and the, the intelligence and the technical ability to actually make those things happen, I just have to believe that the world would be a better place because of that. And I, right. you know, I just feel this immense sense of gratitude in part for you, Eric, because I feel like there's, there's no one else I would want to take this professional journey with, right? Like you're the right leader for the people that we hire. They look up to you. They know you understand it. You set the tone for our organization. And um, I don't know. I think the next couple of years are going to be just as exciting, exciting. as this one. Yeah. Well, and that's a fun part for me. And, and one of the things that I've struggled with through my whole career is that that piece that you're so good at, sort of the, I'm not going to call it woo, because you, I don't think you have that as, have as sort of your I'm a relator skill. on the strength. You're, yeah, I have yeah, you're no a relator, right? <laughs> but <laughs> where people, you know, and, and I find myself doing it every once in a while, people just walk into your office and go, let me tell you all the stuff going on in my life in really gory detail. And, and, and it's like, what, why are you telling her that? Like, you just met her like five minutes ago, you just met her and you're bearing your soul. Right. Uh, but it's, it's sort of the fun part of it is sort of this Adam Smith, uh, sort of, um, gosh, what was his big theory, right? Sort of, uh, division of labor, right. Is that we get, we each get to kind of do our part where we, where we really sing and grow, right. Where we get to do the yeah. part that's sort yeah. of the best of us. Um, whereas before I think it was, and, and I think the industry in general is like, look, you're, you're an advisor and that means you have to do all of these things and you have to right. do all of these things really, really, really well. And the fun part for me and, and where I, I see us going is this not just for you and I, but in general is I get to do the stuff that I'm passionate about, that I'm good at, that I love to go do. And I get to sort of partner up with all these other cool people that get to do their part. Right. And, it, and it's each of us sort of sort of singing our part in the harmony is pretty cool, like because it makes a nice we, song, but it makes a nice song. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's key, too. Right. When you have a bunch of people that are living in their strengths um, in their work environment, it just means that they're that much more productive and they're happier. Right. That degree of engagement, I think, is it, it benefits all of us, those in the office and then the people that we're serving as well. And I just you know, I don't know. I I. I kind of did this year in review moment where I was looking, okay, what have we done? How have we impacted people's lives? And, um, you know, I think we saw exponential growth last year and it really skyrocketed. And there's probably a piece of that, that because Zoom became, you know, meetings over the internet became commonplace. It was really I'm easy saying. for people to have these meetings during their day where before they'd have to leave work and come to the office. And we still have people who are specifically requesting that because nothing replaces face-to-face -face conversation. Right. Um, but I do think there's a lot of people who probably for the first time had the ability to have these meetings during a normal work day. And then I also think that the messaging is right right? There's, there's a, a time when 
all of the external factors and the internal factors come together. And, and I think when you look at what's happening kind of in our country right now and where, where we're headed, I think, I think there is a space, especially among people who are really trying to build work wealth, right? I almost said worth there, but uh, it's wealth, but I think there's a degree of worth there too, because what you do with your money um, says a lot about who you are, right? And, right. you know, there's all this flashy stuff on Instagram right now that's like, ooh, you have all these things, right? And it's about the shows and the displays of wealth. And I don't have a problem with that. I mean, you like nice things. I like nice things. It's, you know, you you go out and get them. But I think there's a difference between, you know, doing things that you really enjoy and that make you happy, right? And then a display that is meant to validate you. And um, right. there's, there is a difference there, right? And it's not to, there, there's not judgment for people who want all the luxuries at all, because I think there's a, you know, people, people fall on one side of that. They either think they deserve it all or they don't. Um, and, and all that is good. But I think when we look at really who our clients are, they are people who care about their communities. They, they want the world to be a better place. They want to enjoy nice things. But I think most frequently the messaging that, that resonates the most is how do I get to the place where I've got income coming in automatically? Cause that frees me up to go either figure out what my purpose is or to live a purpose that I know I should be living that I don't get to have right now. And, and that to me, those are the people I like to help more than anything. Um, I think we're going to do that a lot over the next couple yeah. of years. Well, and if, and if there was one blessing that came from COVID, I think in our, in our industry, but also our world is that it gave everybody sort of a permission slip to do a reset button. I'm like, yeah. okay, wait, 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 stop. Everything else is sort of in topsy turvy, kind of starting this company, right? Everything yeah. else sucks. Everything else is chaos. Why not create a company in the middle of it? What, what could go wrong? Uh, but I think it's given everybody that permission stuff to go, okay, wait, 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 what's important? What's not important? What do I want to add back on when it's, I have the ability to add it back on. And what have I noticed that it's gone and good riddance? Like I'm not adding it back in because it, I hated it then and I felt like I had to do it because of X, Y, and Z and I'm out and I'm not doing it. Yeah. Uh, and I think it gave everybody that refresh moment of like, am I working to work because I need to go get a paycheck or because I need to save all this money in this account or because I'm, because I should, right? Is sort of the way to say it, right? right? Or am I working because this is where I'm passionate? This is where I can serve. This is where I'm adding, adding value in life. Um, and I think that's been the fun conversations because they've been much more open over the past probably six to 12 months. Yeah. And it's been refreshing. It's like, oh, I haven't heard you talk that way before. Not you, but like for clients, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I want to, I'm tired of living like that. Yeah. It's and I think, refreshing. I think that the feedback that I've gotten from you, I think I feel this way. I think our advisors feel this way is that once we understand what someone's hopes and dreams are, it is so cool to be like, let me figure out how we can make that happen. Right. Let yeah. me figure that out. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's where, you know, we're looking for people who are like-minded, right. As a firm that are thinking, let me figure out how I can help other people have what they want. And then ultimately you get rewarded for that. I always kind of jokingly say that the compensation is just certificates of appreciation. <laughs> we I, did, do I did a good job today. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's and, my joke you know, with the clients on that is like, look, you, you're doing all the hard work. It's the old grease joke, right? If you can't be an athlete, at least be an athletic supporter, right? <laughs> right? Like you're saving all the money. You go to work. I just get to come in on the side and come alongside you and like, no, 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 do it this way. And then I look like a hero, but like, you're the one saving all the money. I just get to show you how to do it better. What to do better. Yeah. No, I love that. I absolutely do. Well, I think we're going to have a, a bright future ahead of us. I don't think it will always be easy. I am a realist from that oh, perspective. <laughs> we have some, some challenges in terms of scaling, right? And uh, I think if we keep working, we'll be able to overcome them and grow. But you know, the one thing, and I'm just going to throw this out there is that we are hiring. And if our environment, where we're coming from, what we're doing, I mean, we still feel like a startup internally, even though we have what, like 12 and 15 years of experience. Uh, but internally, essentially, we are a startup. But I think because of that, there's also a lot of opportunity inside of our firm for people to kind of come in and say, hey, I like this, I want to do this. And we've seen that even with our, our marketing director, who came in just to do the marketing piece. And now, she's like, wait a minute. I love this. I want to convince other people to come work here because it's been life-changing for me. Can I start recruiting advisors? And I'm like, 
yes, but you got to find your replacement because I need you. Right. But, you know, I, I love the fact, and I think this stems again from the way I approach the world. Like you tell me what you're excited about. We'll find a way to make it happen, right? You design your career in a way that you're excited. Right. And I think with both of us, one of our key strengths is uh, strategy, right? right? Strategic on the strengths finder. Um, and so if we understand what someone wants, that's like, woo, we both get giddy, right? Like, let's figure out it's how a to problem do it. to solve, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I think there's lots of people who approach the world that way too. We just need to like set out a beacon so that they all end up here making people's <laughs> lives better. But that's kind of, that's kind of my vision for the future. Yeah. I, I think that we can do it. Um, I'm an internal optimist, even though I am a realist at heart as well. Um, but, you know, I think we have a, a bright future ahead of us. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be doing it, right? <laughs> right. No doubt. No doubt. Oh, so, anyways. Well, thank yeah. you for being on this journey with me. I, I can't oh, say that. Thanks for, thanks for kicking it off, right? <laughs> and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.